So, tense, ni amalina mio wap in lavokan maso, ni ani hiao ki neskum te nawao. Um, that's my traditional language for introducing myself. I come from the Cree First Nation, which is in northern Alberta. I'm from one of the communities that's impacted by tar sands, and my family still lives there till this day. And I'll explain a little bit about what that looks like and how that um, is affecting our families. There's nothing on this planet that compares with the destruction going on there. If there were a global prize for unsustainable development, the tar sands would be a clear winner. I was born in the left extraction zone, the Peace River region. Um, so that's where my family currently resides and has lived for for generations. There's two different kinds of extraction. There's the surface mines that probably people have seen before, the pictures, the big open pit mines. And then there's the underground mining, which is also called in situ, which is Latin for in place, or SAGD, steam assisted gravity drainage. So that's two different extractions and I'll talk about the process and a little bit of the differences between the two and the similarities. We come from the Boreal Forest, which is an ancient um, old growth forest, pristine um, forest, which they call the lungs of the earth, it kind of wraps around the northern section of the planet. Since 1978, over $14 billion have been taken out of our traditional territory, and yet my family still has no running water. So where we see um, the impact zone, which is that big purple star, that's what we call ground zero, that's where tar sands is being extracted. But we can see the amount of pipelines and these little square boxes are the refineries or the cancer alleys where we see more um, emissions being um, released into the atmosphere because tar sands is different in the sense that it's not conventional crude, it's, it's unconventional. So that means they not only need to extract it from the earth, they need to refine it and then need to upgrade it, um, upgrade it and then refine it to create synthetic crude. So it's a different process that it has to go through. And that's why it looks like this. This is the first part of the extraction process. The mines is happening in the Athabasca region. You see the yellow, the yellow trucks there. Those are the biggest dump trucks in the world. So those are three stories high. They basically go into the um, mines and are basically loaded on from those scrapers and then they're driven back to the extraction site. Since operations began, tar sands extractors have moved more than 1.4 billion tons of what industry calls overburden, which is the boreal, pristine boreal forest. So this is how much earth has already been moved in the tar sands. Um, and, it's, and it continues every day 24 seven. What these tailing ponds are is the byproduct after the extraction happens. So this, what's in, in this pool, you can't really see but up close, but um, once you look closer, you, this is what it actually looks like. It looks like an oil spill on land. Um, and they just sit there on the landscape. And um, it's cyanide, it's mercury, lead, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and amphenic acids, which are known carcinogens, um, VOCs, volatile organic compounds, heavy metals. So it's, very, it's a toxic sludge waste um, that's essentially there and they don't have anything, they don't have anywhere to put it, so that's why it's spewed into the landscape. Every day in the tar sands, over 11 million liters of toxic contaminants are leached into the Athabasca. For one barrel of tar sands oil, 1.5 toxic sludge barrels are produced. For every barrel of oil, three to five barrels for um, surface mining is consumed of water. 1,606 ducks landed um, in one case um, and pe all perished, all 1,606 ducks perished. Spines are twisted, um, malformed fins and also tumors or cysts. This is taken in our territory, so this is at a shell plant. We're just, you know, you see a lot of signs like this all that dot the landscape all over the north. Poisonous gas, danger, no entry. And that takes us to the other type of extraction, which is the underground mining that I was talking about. So what they do is it looks a lot more benign on the surface, um, but it's not because what they do is they superheat steam to 240 to 350 degrees Celsius. They push it into the earth's core um, down to a bitumen or the tar sands level, and then they melt the earth there and then they suck it back up and then they have byproduct. Um, but it actually, seg D um, or underground mine takes actually four times as much natural gas to produce one more barrel of oil because they have to, they have to steam and they have to produce so much steam that uses more natural gas. So as you can see here, this is what an, it's one of the SAG D, this is just one site well pad. There's you know, hundreds of well pads um, that, so we see the pipe, this is from taking from the, this is piping, those lines, those crisscross lines are seismic exploration to check where tar sands is. Um, and this is one of the well pads, one of the many well pads that you see. Um, this is stat oil, this is taken from the air as well. So this is a Norwegian company. This is what fragmentation will look like after it's all said and done. So, and these are all SAG-D in situ leases that have already been granted from the Alberta government. And this is, the, that top part is whited out because that's the mines, so it just, it's just done, it's gone. There's, no, there's nothing left for us there other than the operations. 
Um, and you can see, this is, an, this is more issues that we're dealing with with um, a lot of the steam leaks and explosions from SAG-D or in situ. This is Total, so this is a French company. And so this is what happened, there was an explode, explosion and it actually created a 300 meter crater in the earth. And this is what it looks like on the ground. So it's just like melted earth, melted, you know, bitumen that, this is close to the community of Formakai as well, so it's scary when you have one of these operation plants beside you. Potential pipeline explosions, especially because we're using natural gas to produce tar sands to make tar sands, so we're using one fossil fuel to make another fossil fuel, and we're connect close to these, you know, pipelines. We also have hydrogen sulfide issues um, in the region. You can see the exceedances are the big yellow dots. We pulled out the Kyoto Protocol, one of the only countries to ever do that. Um, and then I really think this is really powerful. When I read this, Kofi Annan, who was the former UN Secretary General, um, in his Global Humanitarian Forum, they estimated that over 300,000 people every year die of climate change and millions more are made climate refugees. And the fact that Canada is contributing to this, I think is extremely irresponsible. Um, you can see Alberta tar sands as a project alone, we produce, as I said, 400 million tons, which is bigger than entire countries. So there's some ads out there that are saying, oh yeah, everything's fine. Once we you know, deforest the area, once we um, get all the tar sands out, we're gonna put it back to its natural state and it's gonna be great. This is a before picture of what the Boreal looks like. You know, like you can see it's very peaty, mossy, very um, diverse a diverse ecosystem, and this is what their after looks like. So the woodland caribou, as I said, extirpated by 2040. Um, the lynx, which is something that I rarely see, I mean, I've probably seen maybe once in my life, if that, elders talk about them disappearing. Song, migratory birds are um, from the north to the south. They, there's actually, it's really unfortunate that there's a migratory path from, for birds from North, South America to North America, like the whooping crane. Further encroachment on the land, contamination and destruction of the territories, which is resulting in a loss of culture, a loss of traditions, and a loss of customs. This is not somewhere where we can practice um, sustainable livelihoods. Uh, and you can see that what our land is being replaced by, this is in our territory in um, Lubicon territory. This is the Trans-Canada North Central Corridor pipeline, which was a natural gas pipeline that was brought in to fuel tar sands extraction into the Athabasca region. And you can see flaring happening on a daily basis. And then, then we deal with things like this, which is I think one of the reasons why I've come here today. These are people. Um, this oil spill happened about, as the crow flies, probably like, you know, a few miles away from my family's homes, um, down the highway, about 10 minute, 10 minute drive. Um, it was one of the biggest oil spills in Alberta's history. Uh, actually bigger than the Kalamazoo. This was 4.5 million liters, the Kalamazoo was three. Um, and 28,000 barrels. So this spilled into our traditional territory for over eight hours uh, before they finally realized that they should shut it off because they overrid the system three times. And this is uh, an American company, Plains Midstream. They're based in Texas. Um, and so what happened was that the community, my family didn't even know that there was a spill. Um, they thought it was a propane leak in the community because people couldn't breathe and they were like, it was just pervasive. And so my, my, my auntie, who's a teacher, she's been teaching for 30 years um, in, this, in the local community school, was texting me and saying like, we can't breathe, our eyes are burning, um, we feel nauseous, stomach aches, people feel like they're gonna pass out. The teachers don't wanna hold the students here anymore because they're feeling like really nauseous and pa like they wanna pass out, they don't feel safe keeping these students here. So they canceled school for a week and a half. Um, and what happened was that we were looking, I was looking online and I was trying to figure out for my family what they were, what was happening. Was it a propane leak? Was it an oil spill? What, what was it? What, was it flaring from the local operations? What was happening? And we couldn't find anything. There was nothing from the government, nothing from the company online at all, or even told to the community. And so what I found was over the weekend was a business website that said, um, one pipeline has been shut down because of a spill. And it said, originally it said a couple hundred um, barrels. And when, after the last federal election, when the Harper government was elected as a majority, um, then they released the information to the community a day after, five days later after the spill, that it was one of the biggest spills in Alberta and Canada's history. You know, a number of weeks after, after arguing with planes midstream to let us into our traditional territory to see the, the spill site. Um, even, this is another picture we took from the air, 
because it was the only way to originally access it. This is, yeah, people, and then you can see the muskeg. So this is, this is actually around this time. So it's, you know, before everything turns green. Um, so the, the muskeg um, is actually really green and very vibrant in the, in the summertime. And you can see the trees, but this is the two year anniversary will be on April 29th of this month. Isobutenes and hexenes, which are like pretty, one of the most, hexenes, which is really extremely toxic, um, is causing these, the headaches, the dizziness, the eye irritation. Um, if high concentration, it can also affect the nervous system, which is which happened in the Kalamazoo spill. Um, and that's mostly within the 24 hours, but it was being smelt throughout the community for weeks. And so I went back with the, one of the counselors, because um, this is his hunting and trapping ground, and um, this is what we found, just like a dead pond, a dead, a dead zone. It had no life on the top, no like little bugs, you know, when you see in the water, in this, in, because this is when July 5th of last, last year. Um, and we found just like toxic sludge and you can see the kind of like the black goo. You can see the counselor taking a, a water bottle sample of just black, black water. Um, so this is the type of cleanup that they talked about that was reclaimed. Um, so it's, it's, it feels like it's never ending really. This is a picture of the Kalamazoo. I was privileged enough to sit on a panel with Michelle, who's from the Kalamazoo, that talks about what happened to their community. And it was really eerie, the similarities between the two and what happened to their families as well. Because the, the dill bit is heavy, it sinks down to the water. And so that's why a lot of the skimming process didn't ha work so well. And that's why they're still cleaning up certain areas. And it took two years for them to open up certain areas, other parts of the, air, of the river. And so that was something that was really concerning to hear for pe communities that will have pipelines come through their communities that would take, that would carry the dill bit or the diluted bitumen. I'm almost done here, but this is actually a invitation for people that feel so inclined to ever come to the tar sands. We hold a yearly or an annual um, event called the Healing Walk. Um, this will be our fourth annual Healing Walk, and actually Bill McKibben's coming this year. Um, other people like Naomi Klein. Um, we sent out a lot of invitations. What the elders had asked us to do the first year was to hold a healing walk, and they didn't want it in the form of a protest. They wanted it in the form of like healing and talking and thinking about what healing looks like on landscapes like this. And so what we do is a, a, a walk in the tar sands um, in one of the highways that goes by an upgrader and a couple of tailing ponds. You can see mines on the way in from a distance. And you just walk and we pray in the four directions to um, try to bring awareness to how, how can we stop this destruction and how can we really start the process of healing of Mother Earth. And um, that's the end of that. And I'm gonna ask Dylan to come back up and thank you. So for many of us, the corporate governmental alliance that you've confronted just feels overwhelming. I mean, just the feelings of hopelessness and so forth. And you see this kind of destruction that you've confronted directly. I mean, how do you keep your energy and your commitment up coming out and talking to groups like this and, and dealing with that kind of almost overwhelming power? When the spill happened, it was just something that was, that was devastating. Like, I, it took me probably over a year or a year and a half to actually feel things again. Like I just was so numbed off of like not feeling um, that the, that feeling shut down by the government, feeling the divisions that it created in the communities, the, the corporation not being accountable and just the lies that were being like, that were said and um, that were basically negating the concerns and the health of my family um, all for the profit and for big oil to, to continue to profit. And that's, I think that's one of the frustrating things about being in Alberta. They call it Little Texas. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's definitely not an easy place to live in. It's not an easy place to organize in. Um, but I think that if there's people that, you know, I work with a, a handful of people in Alberta, but working with other people in other parts that are concerned as well, I think that's really something that's uplifting. And knowing that, you know, um, I was asked to come here for a number of months before I, if we finally were able to set it up. And knowing that people want this information is, is also inspiring and that people care um, is also something that kind of keeps me going on a daily basis, so thank you. Thank you. When you destroy our homelands, it's a part of who we are as a people and that's our connection that when we go onto the land, we pray on the land, we feel we're not separate from the land and that's a part of our, our our spiritual cosmos and the way that we view ourselves and 
you know, we, I think a lot of people, we don't say we own the land, the land owned, owns us, and we're very much interconnected in that way. We're not a separation. There's not the hierarchy or the, that we see, and so it's a circle of life. And, and so when you go out and destroy the land and you destroy our territories, it's like it's destroying a part of us and destroying the places where we pray. I want to say Kachi Wiliwane from Banawepskewi, the, uh, the first and original stewards of this land. Now, it's my understanding that all this is going to export, and I was wondering if you can shed any light on how the tar sands are being used. Is it for regular domestic use? Um, our, our energy, our oil in this region right now does not come from tar sands. Um, many of us would like it to, to keep it that way, and there's a, a number of policies, including the city of Portland, considering um, to say we don't want to start buying um, any oil from tar sands, and, um, and so that's um, currently the, the status and, and would be good to keep it that way. The oil and gas industry, especially tar sands, is so capital intensive. So if you actually put $1 million into tar sands, you get three jobs back. If you put $1 million investment into, say, a light and rail system or a transportation system, you get 25 jobs back. The fact that they're using the economy and the jobs argument is just, it's a fallacy. Because you actually produce more jobs when you put money into investment in green, green jobs. And we know that, and we know that would happen. And so I think the fact that they're sending workers, tar sands workers, and people that work in this industry, thousands across the country, to their death because they're, gonna, they're coming away with cancer. We see these workers in their 70s that have worked there since the 60s. I know these people, they have serious health issues. And the fact that they're not letting communities live in a sustainable way, in a healthy way, I think is, is it completely immoral. If nothing else, you can put your body on the line. Last week I saw a picture of an 87-year-old woman who had changed her, chained herself to machinery to stop tar sands. Um, but I would say that to continue um, to educate ourselves and continue to educate our families, sharing this information to our communities, um, holding like, um, doing the kind of community teachings, holding um, film, like film screenings, like empowering your community to make an informed decision um, instead of kind of keeping it in um, ourselves because I think if I didn't actually talk and go into other communities and do this work, I'd probably feel really disempowered and trying to figure out how to empower ourselves and our families and our communities to make that difference, to talk about these solutions and talk about the problems as well and just be really honest with that global addiction is something that I really encourage um, people to do.